just welcome you to the first Animal Behavior Seminar of Spring Quarter. Um, it's my pleasure to be introducing Jennifer Chen. Um, so Jennifer, is, um, this is the, the culmination of, uh, of many years of hard work. When I was thinking about how I wanted to introduce her, uh, I have a friend that uh, runs a creative writing workshop business. And sometimes one of the things she'll do is she challenges me to say, can you summarize this in just a few words? Um, so I, I took that approach to what I want to say about Jennifer. I have three words to describe Jennifer. And the first is striving. But I've just been so impressed with Jennifer's commitment towards being a better person, to her commitment to what she wants to contribute to society. Um, this has just been a theme that has run through our relationship from the, from the first moment we met. And she was really thinking about how could, how could she contribute to, to agriculture and, um, and, and also gain skills and, 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 and strengthen her ability to, to make the world a better place. The second word is heart. Um, and I can see that actually in the, in the room here. Um, that, that Jennifer just has this huge heart, both for the cows that she works with but also the people she works with. Um, I think that many of, the, of you in this room have been touched, touched by that, um, by, by her deep care for the people around her. She's definitely someone you want in your corner. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third word I came up with was polish. That Jennifer puts so much thoughtfulness into everything she does, but this thoughtfulness sort of rubs things over and over and over until they're really shiny. And I think this is also something that I see reflected back to me. When I go to conferences, people approach me and just, that student of yours, Jennifer, wow. Um, that she's just really able to come across with a brilliance and shine. Um, that I know that she puts so much care and effort into, into making that happen. And I think we're going to see that today. So with that, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Cassandra. I'm already like in tears. I'm so moved and so flattered for that introduction. And I just really need to take a moment to thank her. I feel so lucky to have her as a mentor. When I started my PhD, I had no experience in this field. I was completely new. And she took me under her wing and helped me to become a better scientist. She's given me so many amazing opportunities. And I just can't even begin to express how grateful I am. So thank you. And. Um, this always happens to me, which is why if you've been sitting here for a few minutes, you've seen my sort of looping introduction, thank you acknowledgments, because uh, yeah, this is what happens. So, <laughs> so I just wanted to say also thank you to all of you for coming. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all of the support you've shown me through this journey. And I'm just so proud to be here and so grateful for all of you. So I'm going to start by showing you a little video from an ad campaign that many of you may be familiar with. Great cheese comes from happy cows. Happy cows come from California. Real California <laughs> cheese. Okay, so that cow doesn't like rain, so I guess somebody's happy about this drought at least. Um, but I think that that raises a good question, which is what do cows actually think about water falling on them? So this is a great way to set up my talk because today I'm going to tell you what I think that the cows think about water falling on them. And so I want to tell you a few things first about our California cows. First of all, we have been the number one dairy producing state for over two decades, and we have about 1.8 million lactating cows at any given time. So just to orient you, orient you a little bit, UC Davis is right outside of our state capital, Sacramento, right here, and to the south of us is what we call the Central Valley region. And this is where most of our dairies are located. So even though in the video they showed small groups of cows on pasture, that's a relatively uncommon way to keep dairy cows in our state. Dairies usually look more like this. So these are typical housing systems, and the one on the left is what we call a freestall dairy. The one on the right is what we call a dry lot. 
And although the cows are confined in these housing systems, they aren't restrained. So even though in this photo up here it kind of looks like cow jail, these are called head locks, but the cows aren't usually locked. These, they just put their heads through the bars while they're feeding. And the average size of these farms is about 1,000 milking cows. And I just want to say a quick word about our dairy cows. So modern dairy cows are of this species, Bos taurus, and they were domesticated from the Eurasian aurochs, which is now extinct. So I'm showing you a picture of Maranesa cattle from Portugal, which is a primitive breed that is thought to resemble the aurochs. And I want to point out in this photo that the cow actually has an udder. You can kind of see it. And we don't know exactly how much milk the aurochs would have produced, but based on what we know about beef cattle today, I would estimate maybe one to two gallons per day at most. So we domesticated the Eurasian aurochs, and now this is what most modern dairy cattle look like. So this is a Holstein, and the, in the United States, almost all milk cows are this breed. So the first thing that you'll notice about her is her gigantic udder. And on average in the United States, dairy cows produce about nine gallons per day. But in California, the average is actually higher, and in all of my experiments, my cows produced 10 to 12 gallons per day. And when you're producing that much milk, it generates a lot of metabolic heat. And so with our sunny California weather, that means that sometimes our cows are very vulnerable to accumulating body heat. So the cow that I'm showing in this picture is panting, which is the way that cows try to cope with accumulating heat load by dissipating body heat. But because of the high metabolic demands of milk production, combined with our hot weather, this makes them sometimes unable to cope using these natural mechanisms. And so what can happen is you might see welfare problems, such as discomfort, elevated body temperature, and even mortality in extreme cases. We also see problems with production. So milk production decreases, and fertility is also impaired. And the reason that fertility is important in dairy cows is because they have to have a calf in order to lactate. So managing heat load is an important issue for dairy. And so one thing that dairy farmers can do to help their cows cope is by providing them with cooling resources. And one of the most effective ways to cool them is by spraying them with water. So these water sprinklers are often found mounted over the feed bunk. So when I say feed bunk, I'm referring to this concrete structure where the cows are standing. So these pictures both come from our UC Davis campus dairy. And you'll see again that there are these metal head locks, but cows are not typically kept locked. And the way these sprinklers work is they turn on and off intermittently. So when the water is turned off, heat is drawn away from the body through evaporation. And we know that these are effective for cooling cows by measuring respiration rate or body temperature, which both decrease after cows are sprayed. And one thing I want to point out about these water sprinklers is that they use potable water. They're one of the three required uses for potable water on dairies. And what I'm showing here is estimates that come from samples of commercial dairies for these three main uses, which are spraying cows with water, drinking water for the cows, and water that's used during the milking process. And what you can see is that the amount of water that's used per cow per day varies widely across farms. The reason this is important is because we're in a historically severe drought. So potable water is an increasingly limited resource, and the use of this resource is a really critical issue for the sustainability of dairy farming in our state. So my research is driven by wanting to improve the sustainability of dairy farming. And I have two main goals. And the first, as I discussed, is to reduce the use of potable water. And the other is to improve animal welfare. And what that means is the quality of life of those dairy cows. We want them to be happy. And sometimes these two interests can actually compete. So what I'm interested in looking at is how to balance these. And something that affects both the cooling effectiveness of sprinklers and the amount of water that they use is actually cow behavior. So what I'm showing in this photo is the feed bunk is a little bit off camera here, but the sprinkler nozzle here is on. And this gate to the rest of the pen is open. So cows could choose to use the sprinklers, but instead you can see that they're actually gathered here under this shade structure. They're not using the spray. So when this happens, this means that behavior actually affects whether or not cows get cooled well 
and the waste of water. You can see the water's just running and nobody's there. So I think it's really important to understand cattle behavior. But before I started my PhD, not much was really known about cow behavioral responses to spray. So I want to just go off on a quick tangent. This is, um, I want to explain what's going on with these t-shirts. This is my younger brother, Ian, and he couldn't be here today because he's getting a PhD in particle physics and is working at CERN in Switzerland. <laughs> so he got us these matching t-shirts because they refer to a joke that represents kind of the intersection of our academic disciplines. And it goes something like this. A dairy farmer starts to have terrible problems with milk production, so he goes to his local university to seek help. And a panel of experts gets together to work on the problem, and for some reason, the lead scientist is a physicist, or an engineer, substitute one for the other. So they go and work furiously on the problem, and they come back to the farmer really excited, and they tell him, we have found the perfect solution to your problem, and it's really easy. All it requires is that your cows are perfectly spherical and in a vacuum. <laughs> and the reason I love this is because it's a reminder to me that cows aren't in a vacuum. And what I mean by that is they're in the real world where we have these things that scientists call variables. So if you think about that word, variable, able to vary, this describes things that on one hand could influence the cows, so things like weather. And a question that I get sometimes is, well, how can you really um, draw any conclusions from your research because you don't control the weather? And I'm actually not interested in controlling the weather because I'm interested in capturing a natural range of weather conditions to understand how those influence cow behavioral, physiological, and production responses. And another way in which cows aren't in a vacuum is that they have behavior themselves. They interact with their environments. And as I just described, their own behavior affects other responses, such as how well they're cooled, how much water is wasted, and I care about those outcomes as well. So that's why I like that joke. It's just a reminder to me that there are these real world issues. We're not in a vacuum. So now I'll describe how I incorporate these real world variables into my research. Here's the roadmap for the rest of my talk today. So first, I'm going to tell you what we do know about cattle behavioral responses to spray. And the first is variation that seems to be related to cooling effectiveness and heat load. And then I'll describe some other behavioral responses to spray that don't really seem to have to do with cooling, but maybe could be a reaction to insects in the environment or direct stimulation from droplets hitting the cows. And then I'll tell you my research questions and what I found. So first, let's talk about behavioral responses that seem to have to do with cooling. At the start of my PhD, there had been only a handful of studies done looking at cattle behavioral responses to sprinklers. And these varied in what they found on a spectrum from avoidance on one end to preference on the other. So we had some anecdotal reports of complete spray avoidance. And then in the middle, there was some mixed evidence about whether cows preferred sprinklers, other cooling resources such as shade, or no cooling at all. And then at the other extreme, um, I did a study when I first came to Davis where we finally established that cows had a clear preference for sprinklers. But the story really varied across studies. Why? So one obvious factor that could affect usage of sprinklers is the weather conditions. So in one of the studies where they did not find a preference for sprinklers, this was done under relatively cool conditions on average. Whereas toward the preference end of the response spectrum, the weather was warmer on average. And furthermore, within those studies where cows seemed to prefer spray more, there was a pattern between weather and sprinkler preference, where as the weather got warmer, cows used sprinklers more. And this is pretty intuitive. It seems like what these patterns are showing is that cows will use sprinklers based on their need for cooling as the weather gets warmer. And to me, a logical extension of this observation is to ask whether cows would then prefer sprinklers that would cool them more effectively. So what determines how well sprinklers cool cows? One thing is how much water you apply to them. And the way that you can manipulate the amount of water is through sprinkler flow rate. So that's the amount of water on a per time basis. So to look at this, I did a study where we required cows to use sprinklers. We took behavior out of the equation for now. And we did this by restraining them in those headlocks. So I did actually lock them during that time for one hour. And I tested four treatments. 
So I'm showing the control as orange to represent that the cows were in the sun without shade or sprinklers. And I tested three sprinkler flow rates. And just for simplicity throughout this whole presentation, I'll call those low, medium, and high. And they refer to these ranges that I'm showing here, where the amount of water differed about threefold between the treatments. So this was applied intermittently over the course of an hour, and all cows received all treatments repeatedly on separate days. So I measured respiration rate, which I'll show on the y-axis in breaths per minute. And I put a dotted line to indicate what the starting respiration rate was for all of the treatments. So what I found was that after that one hour of spraying, if cows had no cooling, so that's the controls, their respiration rate went up, indicating they got hotter over time. If they received the low sprinkler, their respiration rate stayed at those starting values. Whereas if they were sprayed with medium or high, respiration rate went down, indicating that they got cooler. So medium and high cooled cows as measured by respiration rate. But what I want to point out is that medium was more efficient for cooling cows. So even though high lowered respiration rate more, the extra water wasn't really worth it in my opinion because each extra liter of water that was used lowered respiration rate by only 0.1 breaths per minute. I also measured body temperature, which I'll show on the y-axis. And what I'm showing on the x-axis is time relative to that one hour treatment. So the blue box is the one hour spray treatment, and then I'm showing time after that. So this is what the body temperatures looked like. So both the medium and high spray were able to not only lower body temperature, but keep it lower after that one hour spray treatment had ended. Whereas that was not the case for the low sprinkler or when cows had no cooling. So these are actually the same data, but now on the x-axis, what I'm showing is time. And what that represents is how long after the end of treatment that body temperature stayed under starting value. So it's to give you a sense of how long cooling lasted after the spray. And my point is the same as with res respiration rate. So even though body temperature stayed lower for longer when cows were sprayed by the high sprinkler, each extra liter of water added only 23 seconds. So again, medium seemed like a more efficient option. So now I've established that cows are cool more, cooled more effectively by relatively higher flow rates than lower ones. And specifically, there was a clear difference between medium and low in the cooling effectiveness. And so if I hypothesize that cows choose sprinklers based on how effective they are for cooling, then a prediction that follows is that cows should prefer sprinklers with a higher flow rate relatively. So now I want to talk about some other behavioral responses to spray that seem to have less to do with cooling. Another challenge that cows face in the summer is insects, like biting flies. And there's a suite of typical behaviors associated with insect avoidance that we see, and these include tail flicks and skin twitches. So I'll show you an example of what those look like. So watch this cow in the front, and if you kind of look at her side, you'll be able to see the skin twitches. So there seems to be evidence that sprinklers can be used not only for cooling, but to deter insects. And this is based on measuring these insect avoidance behaviors under spray or not. So this photo that I'm showing is from a sort of iconic experiment done in our lab a few years ago, where cows could activate overhead showers by stepping onto a platform. And what they found was that a large portion of the visits to the shower were actually quite short. So they speculated that these short visits may have been motivated by insect avoidance rather than cooling. And another piece of evidence is that in some studies, when cows were under spray, the authors observed fewer tail flicks. And this is consistent with the idea that when cows are under the water, there are fewer insects bothering them. But in one of those studies, they also observed more skin twitches, even though they observed fewer tail flicks. So they speculated that perhaps there were more skin twitches because the cows were responding directly to the droplets hitting the skin. Maybe the droplets were stimulating that reaction. So consistent with the idea that perhaps droplets directly stimulate the cows, that might explain why we see another behavioral pattern across studies, which is that cows seem to avoid getting their heads wet. 
So in rainy and windy conditions, it's been observed that cows lower their heads and they also orient themselves so that their behinds are facing the direction where the rain and wind is blowing from. And we see the same thing under sprinklers as well, where cows lower their heads when they're standing under spray. So this led us to wonder, why do they try to avoid getting their heads wet? Maybe the head is more sensitive than the rest of the body, and that's why. But this hasn't been explicitly examined before, so this was one of the things I wanted to ask. So, okay, so we have this idea that perhaps droplets are stimulating the skin somehow. And one of the factors that can affect the amount of stimulation is the size of the droplets, because larger droplets reach higher terminal velocity. So larger droplets generate greater impact forces on the cow. And one thing that affects droplet size is sprinkler flow rate. So we can use flow rate as a proxy for droplet size. Higher flow rates on average have larger droplets. And so there's another observation that may support the idea that cows respond to the size of droplets. So our lab did a study on beef cattle. And they found that when cattle were sprayed with 1.3 liters per minute, which is the same as my medium treatment, they preferred those sprinklers over a feed bunk without any sprinklers. And I've circled the nozzle here that's putting out the medium spray because it's a little bit hard to see. And so they also did a separate comparison where they sprayed twice as much water. But the preference between that treatment and no spray was less straightforward. So that led us to think, well, maybe cows prefer a lower flow rate. But no one had made a direct comparison between different sprinkler flow rates before. So now we've established that we can use higher flow rates as a proxy for larger droplet sizes, which generate greater impact forces on the cow. So if we hypothesize that cows are responding directly to the sensation of droplets hitting them, then we would predict that maybe cows should prefer sprinklers that deliver a lower flow rate. So I wanna just contrast these two hypotheses now for what cows should prefer. So on one hand, if we think cows are responding to how well they are cooled by sprinklers, then we would predict that they should prefer the higher flow rate sprinklers because they're more effective for cooling. But if cows are responding instead to the sensation of droplets directly hitting them, then we would predict that they should actually prefer the lower flow rates because they generate less impact forces. So now I'll explain how I try to get at these different hypotheses. So I'll tell you what my research questions are and what I found. So these were my main questions. First, I wanted to establish whether the head is in fact more sensitive than the rest of the body. And then I wanted to ask whether flow rate as a proxy for droplet size affected whether cows avoided getting their heads wet under spray. Then I wanted to ask the same question for reactions on the rest of the body. Why do insect avoidance behaviors sometimes go up under spray and sometimes go down? And lastly, I wanted to put this together with another variable, which is weather, to ask what affects cows' usage and preference for, for sprinklers in general. So first, is the head more sensitive than the rest of the body? So to ask this, I tested the ear as a proxy for the head and the shoulder region as a proxy for the rest of the body. And I tested sensitivity on these two parts of the body using what are called von Frey monofilaments. And so these are typically used in the literature to test the sensitivity of wounds or to test the effectiveness of analgesics. And the way they work is that each monofilament is calibrated to deliver a certain amount of force once it bends. So you apply it to the skin, and when it bends, it's delivering that amount of force, and you look for some sort of behavioral reaction to show whether or not the animal or the person is responsive to that amount of force. So I used 20 different monofilaments, ranging from 0.008 to 300 grams in force. And what I looked for was an ear flick on the ear or a skin twitch on the shoulder, like I showed you in the video. I tested 58 cows, and I tested them each twice a week apart. So here is a box and whisker plot of my results. And the diamonds represent the means, and the darker, thick bars on the bottom are the medians. So what I found was that the reaction threshold was lower for the ear than for the shoulder. And from this, I concluded that the head is indeed more sensitive than the rest of the body to stimulation. So given that the head is more sensitive than the body, maybe this could explain why cows seem to avoid getting their heads wet under spray. And I wanted to look at the role of droplet size. 
in affecting this response. So this is Alex. I'm mentoring him as he's doing his senior practicum for animal biology. And Alex looked at head lowering behavior in two different study designs. So in the first, um, cows were pushed through a narrow raceway. So what I'm showing here is an overhead view of what that setup looked like. So they were required to walk through spray. And we tested three different treatments. This time the control was shaded, which is why it's color coded as gray. And then we chose the low and high flow rate sprinklers in order to create as large a difference in droplet size as possible. So it was about a threefold difference in droplet size. We tested 15 to 25 animals per treatment, and they were each tested repeatedly. And I'm going to show you a video of what this head lowering behavior looks like. So the cow's head starts out normal, and as she walks through the spray, you'll see her briefly sort of duck her head down and then go back to normal. So look for that. So I'll show it again because it's really brief. So here's what we found. On the y-axis is the proportion of times that cows showed that head lowering out of the total number of trials that we did. So when cows had to walk through the high spray, they did that four times more often than when they walked through the low spray or none. In the second study design, cows were tested in their regular housing pens. So they had more freedom to decide when and how to approach the spray. So we again tested a control and this time we also tested medium versus high spray. So I'll show you a video of what it looked like in this setup. So what you're seeing here on the right is the feed bunk. So feed is delivered in this area. And these are those metal headlocks. This line painted on the ground indicates roughly where the spray would extend to. So if you watch this black cow in front, you'll see that as she crosses that painted line, her head will go from normal to ducked briefly. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the results for when cows were approaching the feed bunk, like in that video. And now on the y-axis is the proportion of times they show that behavior when they were going toward the feed bunk. And what we found was that, regardless of whether it was medium or high, if there were sprinklers, cows showed this behavior twice as often as when there was no spray. And this is for the times when the water was on. And in this study, because cows had more freedom to decide when and how to approach the spray, we also looked at the other direction, so when they were leaving the feed bunk, and we found similar results. So when there was spray, regardless of whether it was medium or high, cows lowered their heads three times more often than when there was no spray. So now if we put this all together, it seems like we have a pretty clear picture that when there's medium or high flow rates, cows will lower their heads when walking through it. Whereas if it's low or no spray, cows don't show this head avoidance behavior. So now we've established that cows do seem to be responding to the effects of flow rate in terms of responses on their heads. But what about the rest of their bodies? What's going on with these insect avoidance behaviors when cows are under spray? I wanted to look at how flow rate might affect these responses. So what I did to ask this was I exposed cows repeatedly to either no spray, which again was shaded, so it's gray, or low or high spray. And again, I chose these in order to maximize the difference in droplet size. So what I'll show on the results graphs is these insect avoidance behaviors on a per minute rate. So for tail flicks, we found that for both low and high sprinklers, we saw fewer tail flicks under spray compared to no spray. So this is consistent with what previous studies found. And it seems like being under the spray deters insects. So we see fewer of these behaviors. And we found the same thing when looking at skin twitches as well. So this is in contrast to the one study that had found that skin twitches increased under spray. Instead, we found the same thing for both tail flicks and skin twitches. So our results suggested that spray in general likely deterred insects. We saw a reduction in both insect avoidance behaviors. So we didn't have any evidence that larger droplets would stimulate the skin more. It didn't matter what the flow rate was, it reduced these behaviors. So I wasn't ready to write off this hypothesis yet. 
And I wanted to look more generally at how both flow rate and heat load and weather affected overall preference and usage of sprinklers. So in one study, I conducted a preference test. And I did this in a shaded arena, and this is an overhead view of what this setup looked like. So there were three locations where I administered the treatments. So in this example, you can see on the left-hand treatment, the left-hand location is the high sprinkler treatment. In the middle is the low, and on the right is the control. And I trained the cows to associate a given location with a given treatment. But I balanced those treatment and location assignments across the animal. So this setup didn't look the same for every cow. And in order to train them, what I did was I exposed them repeatedly to the testing scenario to make sure that when I tested their preferences, they would be making an inf informed choice. And during that training phase is also when I measured those insect avoidance behaviors that I just talked about. So when I tested the cow's preferences, I did this in pairs. So cows only had access to two options at any given time, and I blocked off the third. So in this scenario, I blocked off the middle, and the cow can only choose between the left and the right, which correspond to high and control. So they each received the first preference test eight times, and then the next pair of options, and then the next pair of options. So I'll show you a video to give you a sense of what this kind of preference test looked like. And so this setup is exactly the same as in the diagram I just showed you, where the cow can choose between left and right, which correspond to the high sprinkler and the control. So this is Louise from France, who is helping me. And you'll see that Louise and I will release the gate. The cow will be able to make her choice. And as she makes her selection, just as a bonus, I want you to try to watch her head. So in this particular test, the cow chose the left treatment, which, which corresponded to the high sprinkler flow rate. And you may have noticed that as she entered the location she chose, she briefly ducked her head down. And that's what inspired us to look more at head posture in the first place. So um, after the cow chooses her treatment, we shut her in for 12 minutes to receive the treatment. So what I'm going to show you is my results for overall preference. And so on the y-axis is the three paired comparisons. And what I'm showing on the y-axis is the model prediction for the probability of choosing one of those treatments within each pair. And for consistency, I've oriented it so the probability refers to whichever has the higher flow rate. So first I'll talk about the low sprinkler compared to the control. So what I'm showing in the diamond is the average model prediction with a 95% confidence interval around it. And what you can see is that the dashed line is set at 0.5, which is chance or no preference, and the confidence interval doesn't include 0.5. So cows had a preference for the low sprinkler over the control, which was just shade. But in the other two comparisons with the high sprinkler, I didn't find a preference. So how come cows preferred the low sprinkler over just shade, but not the high sprinkler? I'm speculating that they're using low and high for different functions, and I'll explain what I think those are. So let me explain what I think they're using high for first. So this is the same uh, type of results, but now I've added in air temperature as a predictor. So what you can see is that air temperature at the time of the test is on the x-axis. And as the weather got warmer, the probability of choosing high over control increased. So to me, this is consistent with the idea that cows are using sprinklers with a high flow rate for cooling. So as their need for cooling increased, they were more likely to choose the treatment that would give them that cooling. So in contrast, here's what the same graph looks like for low versus control. So as I just told you, they preferred low over the control overall. And now you can see that that was regardless of weather conditions. So I think what they're using the low for is to deter insects. In the comparison directly between the two flow rates, there was no preference regardless of weather. So now I'll give you some more evidence as to why I think they're using high for cooling and low for insect deterrence. So what I'm showing you on the y-axis is the change in body temperature between the time the cow made her choice and the time we released her 12 minutes later. And I also just want to establish that at the time that cows made their choice, 
there was no difference in that starting body temperature. So here are each of the three paired comparisons. And what I want to focus on first is when cows chose high. So when they chose the high sprinkler, body temperature went down over the course of those 12 minutes. And furthermore, body temperature stayed below starting values even after cows were released. So high was able to lower body temperature and keep it lower afterwards. So in contrast, the low sprinkler didn't lower body temperature. So if you remember to the beginning of my talk, this is consistent with what I found when I restrained cows in those headlocks and required them to use the sprinklers. Low was not able to lower body temperature, but high was. And so this is another reason why I think cows were using the high sprinklers for cooling, but the low sprinklers for insect avoidance instead. So the experiment I just described captured cow's decisions at a snapshot in time. But I was also interested in looking at their usage of, usage of sprinklers over longer time periods in their natural housing system where they had more freedom to decide how to use the sprinklers and when they were making more realistic trade-offs between using sprinklers and other behaviors, such as drinking, which I'm showing on the left, or lying down, like I'm showing on the right. So this was actually the same study I described earlier where we were looking at whether cows lowered their heads when walking through spray. And the reason that I chose the medium and high sprinklers to test in the study is because in the original experiment I did where cows were restrained at the feed bunk, these were the two that I identified as being able to lower body temperature when cows were required to use sprinklers. And now I wanted to see when cows could choose how to use sprinklers, how would their behavior then affect cooling? So before I talk about how behavior affected cooling, I just want to focus on some of the behavioral results that I thought were interesting. So in this graph, what I'm showing is the total number of hours per day that cows spent at the feed bunk. And I didn't find any difference in how long cows spent at the feed bunk, whether or not it had sprinklers. But what if instead of just overall time, we look at the structure of their bouts when they were visiting the feed bunk? So the graph on the left is showing the number of minutes they spent at the feed bunk each time they visited. Whereas on the right, I'm showing the number of times they visited the feed bunk each day. And what we found was that when there were sprinklers, cows spent longer each time they went to the feed bunk, but they went to the feed bunk fewer times per day. And this was regardless of flow rate. So what explains this pattern? What I'm speculating is that this pattern is consistent with sprinklers imposing some kind of switching cost to cows visiting the feed bunk. So my, my speculation is that having to walk through the spray meant that cows would have to get their heads wet, which we have established that they're reluctant to do. So let me explain this a little bit further. First of all, what is a switching cost? This is a term that is used both in economic theory and in optimal foraging theory. So in optimal foraging theory, we might want to predict how long an animal will stay and continue foraging in its current patch of food. So I have my little bee here with a flower. How long should the bee stay at the current flower before moving on to the next one? In order to determine the optimal amount of time to stay, we have to consider the costs and benefits to staying versus leaving. And one of those costs could have to do with the travel time between those food patches. So now if I have these flowers further apart, the bee has to travel for longer to get to the next flower. So that's one type of cost. So what we would predict is that as the travel time increase, that travel cost increases, and thus the optimal amount of time to stay on the current flower increases as well. And I want to point out that a switching cost doesn't have to be distance. It can be something else. And it doesn't have to be moving between food patches. So in my experiment, the way I'm seeing it is that having the spray there imposes a switching cost on the cows. Because if they want to go to the feed bunk or leave it, sometimes they have to walk through spray. And we know they're reluctant to get their heads wet. So to me, I think that's a switching cost. So let me give you some more evidence for how I came to this conclusion. So one thing I wanted to look at was what affects when cows go to the feed bunk? Does it actually matter if the spray is on or off because it was turned on and off in cycles? So what I'll show on the y-axis is the proportion of times they went to the feed bunk when the water was on. And the water was on for three out of every 12 minutes or 25% of the time. So I put a dotted line at 0.25 to represent what we expected just based on chance. And what I found was that when cows were heading toward the feed bunk, 
They went just as often as we expected by chance when the water was on. So I didn't find what I expected, which was a reduction in how often they went when there was spray. And so I'm speculating that in this case, when they're heading toward the feed bunk, they have an additional motivation to feed. So the benefit of going there is higher, and maybe that outweighed any potential costs of walking through spray. But even though cows walk through spray as much as expected by chance, remember that they lower their heads. And this was the evidence that I had that there was some kind of reluctance to get their heads wet. I also looked at the other direction. So now when cows were leaving the feed bunk, they left less often than I expected by chance when their water was on. So perhaps this is consistent with walking through the spray imposing a cost on leaving. The other way to look at it would be if the cows are enjoying the benefits of staying there and receiving spray, perhaps that's why they waited till the water turned off to leave. We can't really know if it's one or the other or a combination of both. But taking this all together, oh, and I also just wanted to say, when they did actually leave when the water was on, again, we saw them lowering their heads. So taking this all together, I do think that cows are using sprinklers for the cooling benefits. But I also think that walking through the spray imposes a cost. So if they were just using sprinklers for their cooling benefits, I think that could explain why they spend longer at the feed bunk each time when there are sprinklers, but that wouldn't explain why there are fewer visits. So we have evidence that cows lower their heads both when approaching and leaving the feed bunk, and they leave the feed bunk fewer times than expected by chance when the water is on. So I think that's what's explaining this reduction in the number of times that they would go. Okay, so now let's talk about how behavior affected cooling. So what I'm showing here is 24-hour average air temperature on the y-axis and on the, uh, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the total time per day they spend at the feed bunk. So if you look at the control treatment, which is the gray dashed line, you can see there wasn't really a relationship between weather and how much time they spent at the feed bunk. But as the weather got warmer, cows spent more time at the feed bunk when there were sprinklers. And again, this is consistent with what we've seen across several studies now, where as the weather gets warmer, cows use sprinklers more. And that's likely because sprinklers provide cooling benefits. So now I'm showing air temperature on the x-axis still, but body temperature on the y-axis. And I've put a dashed line at the upper limit of normal body temperature. And what you can see is that when cows had only shade but no sprinklers, as the weather got warmer, body temperature increased. But when there were sprinklers over the feed bunk, this relationship was much flatter. So even as the weather got warmer, body temperature was kept in the normal range when cows had sprinklers available. And if we don't take weather into account and just look at body temperature overall, we also found evidence that sprinklers provided cooling. So now I'm showing time of day on the x-axis and body temperature on the y-axis still with the dashed line representing normal. And so you can see that when cows only had shade and no sprinklers, body temperature rose above normal in the afternoon. But when they had sprinklers, body temperature was lower from 1 to 8 p.m. each day. And I've circled that with a blue box. I've boxed it with the blue box. <laughs> okay, so now what I'm going to do is give you a one slide summary of my entire PhD, which I feel should be on a t-shirt or something. <laughs> I don't know who would buy it. <laughs> and so what I'm going to show you is my conclusions about low flow rate sprinklers on the left and medium and high sprinklers on the right. So first, what were the weather conditions in which cows used each of these flow rates? What I found was that cows used low flow rates across all weather conditions that I tested in the summer, whereas they seemed to use medium and high flow rates more when the weather was warmer. So how about when cows avoided getting their heads wet? We found that cows did not avoid getting their heads wet when walking through low flow rates, but rather when they were walking through medium and high flow rates. And what flow rates were effective for cooling cows? So when I required cows to use sprinklers, I found that low was not effective, but medium and high were. And I found the same thing when cows were allowed to choose how they used the spray. So I'm showing that sprinklers were able to help cows dissipate heat by these red squiggly lines when the flow rates were medium or high. And finally, what flow rates deterred insects? 
We saw a reduction in insect avoidance behaviors under all the flow rates that we tested. So it seems like spray in general, whether it's low or high flow rate, helps reduce these insect avoidance behaviors. So I'll summarize this again. It seems like cows are using low sprinklers across all summer weather conditions, mainly for insect deterrence, not cooling. And they don't avoid getting their heads wet when walking through those flow rates. Whereas cows seem to use higher flow rates in warmer weather for the cooling benefits that they provide, as well as insect deterrence. But they're reluctant to get their heads wet when walking through the medium in high spray. So if we return to these original two hypotheses I introduced, now they seem overly simplistic. So I didn't find that cows either prefer higher flow rates in general because they provide better cooling, or prefer lower flow rates because they stimulate the skin less. These two hypotheses didn't really capture the complexity of what I ended up finding, which was that cows seem to use lower and higher flow rates for different functions. So now I'll conclude by talking about some of my future directions. So we've established that sprinklers can provide welfare benefits to cows, both by cooling them and possibly by deterring insects as well. And in terms of cooling, we've established that there's a clear difference in effectiveness between lower and higher flow rate sprinklers. So now what we want to focus on is further reducing water use in order to conserve potable water. So one way to do this would be to look at if we can further reduce the flow rate below medium or 1.3 liters per minute. And another way to do that would be to use a higher flow rate, but apply it for shorter amounts of time. And another exciting option is to develop a sensor that would detect whether or not a cow is present before activating sprinklers. And that way we wouldn't see that scenario I showed you in the beginning where the water is just running even though nobody's there. So we're collaborating with some uh, agricultural engineers to develop this kind of system, and we have a working prototype, which is really exciting. And another thing I think is exciting about this technology is it could potentially allow cows to approach, this, the, sprink, um, approach the feed bunk while the sprinklers are off. So that way they could put their heads into the headlocks and then the spray would turn on. And maybe that would actually improve usage and cooling effectiveness. And we want to test these options on large commercial dairies to look at how much water could be saved and look at cooling effectiveness. And also that way we would be able to measure milk production and fertility. So we're really excited about all these possibilities and we're actually submitting a USDA grant for this that's due in less than two weeks. So please wish us luck. And I'd like to conclude just by thanking you all again for coming. So can we turn the lights on? Is the right hand one there? Thank you. Okay, I'm happy to take questions. Marisano? Um, um, I've had a couple of questions for you. One, is there um, any known effect of the temperature of the water that you spray? Mm, great question. So Marisano's first question was about whether there are effects of water temperature. And we would certainly expect that there would be because that would create a great a higher gradient in temperature between the cow and the water that's being applied. And I think that that's a completely legitimate question from a thermodynamic perspective. But I'm really interested in practical solutions that farmers can use, and it's really hard for them to control their water temperature. Right, so but that was just wondering, because yeah. our temperature drops yeah. rather dramatically. And, mm -hmm. like, and so you could capture that. It's yeah. going to take the water longer to heat up. And so maybe you could get cooler water that way when it's cheap. Yeah, I think... I think it's something that's worth exploring, but we wanted to start with things that would be easier for them to change, like the timing or the nozzles. They have to change them anyway for maintenance. So I think that's a great idea. It's just not okay. the most immediately feasible. And, and one other thing, while you have these engineers looking at, <laughs> at um, activating the water, is there a way to also have the cows choose their own preferred way of mm. Yeah, I love that idea. And we've thought about that too, and I think it would be possible because when you have a long feed bunk, you have to space individual nozzles about two meters apart. So we could do like a choose your own nozzle kind of situation where, and they're actually color coded, that's just the industry standard. So like medium is red, high is green. So if the cows could recognize that, then maybe they could approach their favorite nozzle. I think that's a cool idea. Yeah, yeah, no, there's a way to do it. So what we're looking at is actually passive infrared. So it detects if a cow's there, but you could maybe pair it with like RFID to recognize the individual. Or you could just do what I suggested, which is have green on this half, have red on this half, and they just know which way to go. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, give them more freedom. What about fans? What about mm -hmm. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Koss is asking about fans, and this is another question I get a lot. So in this region, we tend to have low relative humidity and high natural airflow. So on commercial dairies, you don't typically find fans mounted over the feed line because there's a lot of natural airflow. But they do put fans in the lying area, and that's really common to provide additional airflow under the covered structure. Yeah, so that would definitely help with the evaporation, but because of where we are, we don't really need that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Are there typically with the sensors, along with the sensors, would be possibly a sun or temperature sensor as well? Yeah, so that's a great question. She was asking about the sensors and whether they're activated by weather variables. So right now, the most common way to control sprinkler activation is with a cycle timer. So you set a temperature threshold. It does have a temperature sensor. You could say, well, you know, when it's 72 degrees Fahrenheit, I want the sprinklers to start turning on so they don't usually run overnight. And that is something that we have put in the prototype for the sensor, so that we could set a, both a minimum air temperature threshold and how often it would stay on, et cetera. Yeah. But, sorry, I'm going to add to that. <laughs> so I think it's important to set some kind of threshold so that you're not unnecessarily running water when it's too cool. But I think the downfall of that is that you're basing it on the environmental conditions, but individual cows vary too. So I think it'd be really fantastic if in the future we could sense if individual cows are hot, whether we could sense their respiration rate or whether they're panting, some, something like that where we're actually measuring the cow and not just the weather. Because for example, I'm not heat tolerant at all. I'm really sympathetic to the cows because I start to feel hot on days like this. So I wouldn't want to be sprayed, where, or I would want to be sprayed rather, whereas some other people wouldn't. They love the hot Davis weather. So I think that would be taking it to the next level. Yeah, cow Fitbit, yeah, <laughs> totally, yeah. I have a question. Sorry, question. And, and just a quick follow-up on the temperature question. Do you think some of the differences that you see between the low flow and the high flow rate could be due to different temperatures at those different conditions? Because at the low flow, probably the water warms up in the pipes much mm -hmm. more than during the high flow. <coughs> So that's a good question. He's asking about whether the different flow rates would have different water temperatures, and I measured that, and I didn't find differences. Yeah, because um, that is one of the reasons why manipulating water temperature is so hard, because the water lines are on the top of the feed bunk. So if it's in the sun, it starts to heat up. So that's another challenge for why we haven't really looked into water temperature. But I did measure that. Don't worry. <laughs> Brandy? Yeah, I was just, um, I don't know if I missed this, but I guess I was just, my line of thinking is, oh, could we just reduce water usage by only just having the shade method? But I don't know if I missed that maybe shade isn't as effective in cooling, and two, maybe these bunk different bunkers are just so not cost effective because it's so expensive to provide shade or shaded structures. Yeah, so Brandy's asking about shade, and I didn't say that, and I should have. And so one thing I want to note is that if a farmer were to ask me, what should I do, my cows are really heat stressed, I would ask, do you have shade? Because I think shade is the first line of defense because shade prevents them from gaining heat, whereas sprinklers help them dissipate heat. So you want to stop them from getting hotter in the first place. And we have a lot of evidence that shade use is part of the natural behavioral repertoire of cattle. So cattle find shade really important. They'll work hard to get access. So I think shade is definitely important. But sprinklers are more effective for cooling than just shade. So when you have just unshaded sprinklers versus just shade, the sprinklers are more effective. But when you combine them, that's even better. And I think if you combine them, then cows will more willingly use it too. And a lot of these dairies do have shade over the feed line, but it's kind of variable. And my colleague Rosini in the back is looking at getting a sense of what's really going out there so we can make better recommendations. Yeah, and is the, are the providing shade in the first place, is that uh, less cost effective? Because those structures themselves might be very expensive to implement. Mm. There are different ways of doing it. So in the dry lot dairies, like the photo I showed you where the water was just running, they have a solid structure in the corral. But over the feed line, sometimes you find a solid structure, sometimes you find shade cloth. So I'm not really sure of what the costs are involved, but I think it is cost effective because if you don't have shade over the feed bunk and you're running the water, then you could just be wasting water. Because so I think having the shade there helps cows be willing to go. Yeah, and now it's actually becoming more common to find shade on beef facilities as well, because it's so effective. I'm curious if you have any idea as to the effect of not just the flow rate, but how the sprinkler heads dissipate the water. Mm -hmm. So like from a stream to say a mist, do you think mm -hmm. that would have a different effect? Um, so all of these are what are called soaker nozzles. And we chose these because they have relatively large average droplet sizes. So every time you're delivering spray, wish Ken was here, he's a spray engineer, you have like a Gaussian distribution of droplet sizes. 
So there are always smaller and larger droplets. So it's not a stream, it, is, it kind of comes out like this. But I didn't choose any that you would call mist because the function of mist, really, really fine droplets, is more so that the cow inhales it. It's like convective cooling, so it changes their respiration rate, whereas all of the ones I chose are intended to directly wet the animal, penetrate through the hair coat, and wet the skin so that it evaporates using their body heat. Um, does that get at your question? Yeah. yeah. So I can keep going. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maristano. Uh, is, it, is it effective to, to wet the cow or the meat? No. Yeah, great question. That's like one of my pet questions, actually. Um, there are these things called wash pens. And what they do is they're like a little fountain under the cow, and they come up and spray them. And these are located in the waiting area for the milking parlor, and they're actually used to wash the udder. But some farms have stopped using it because there's this idea out there that if you wet the udder, it could cause mastitis, which is an udder, udder infection, but that's totally unsubstantiated. This is something where we've just never seen any evidence, but I do think that the wash pen could provide cooling, and then the cows don't have to get their heads wet. And the udder, you know, because there's so much going on there metabolically, I think it's a good source of heat exchange, but we haven't been able to do these types of studies because I think there's just too much feeling out there that, no, that's going to cause mastitis. But it's something we really like to talk about. <laughs> It's mom. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Chen. <laughs> yes. So not for this type of purpose right now, because there are concerns about animal health. For example, if there's bacteria in the water, it could cause mastitis or other problems and also food safety. But there is a lot of re water recycling going on on dairies. So all I showed in that first graph with the three main uses of potable water are where we have to use clean water. But there's a lot of great water recycling for flushing manure out of the pens, and then that's applied onto the field as fertilizer. So there is a lot of recycling. These are just the three areas where we think, right now we don't have a good way to use recycled water. Yeah, so this is a seasonal phenomenon, right? You don't run this in the winter and what Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. what do farms in Wisconsin do? So, okay, so the first part of the question was, this is seasonal, so we don't run them in the winter, and that's correct. So usually it's set on a temperature threshold. So last November, I actually went out to our campus dairy and the sprinklers were on because it was hot enough. Yeah, so it's really weather dependent. And then in Wisconsin, in more humid environments, like Florida, for example, this strategy doesn't necessarily work as well because the humidity is higher, so there's less evaporative potential. So there they use fans more, like what Dr. Koss suggested. So they have to use sort of different strategies. In Wisconsin, I'm not really sure, but I know that like in Canada, sometimes they have a few days where it gets hot, but they just aren't as focused on this problem. So I'm not sure. But California is the number one dairy state, so we got to take care of our cows. <laughs> so they're not applying anything to help out with insect control, as far as you know. Um, Dan, do you know? I don't think so, because I mean, these are food producing animals, and so you have to use chemicals that are like allowed for food purposes. So for example, when I was testing the sensitivity, I wanted to make sure that cows were responding to the filaments I was applying and not to actual insects. So I put like a pyrethrin-based insect repellent near them, but normally we wouldn't apply that. I mean, they have like the... In places where they're not using water, oh, uh -huh. they still may be using mist, so mm. they help effectively like Do they? remove the part of the so they can use just different in terms of they're using, I don't know if they're really using but they're definitely using it to actually just cool the environment. The air. Uh -huh. yeah. So you get these um, farms that are enclosed with um, pretty extensive ventilation yeah. systems. Okay. You see that in horse barns too, the mist. Are there techniques from looking at other animals to say you have to go to places where you have to have a hunt there, a little bit of free ranging? Mm -hmm. Are they regulated to the body temperature? Are mm -hmm. the ponds, because you see yeah. a lot of these water holes, mm -hmm. and the little water hole they cluster together by, by species, and they're obviously doing something. Now that might have yeah. contaminated water, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's a really simple idea that you can allow the yeah. without water evaporation. So he's asking about other ways of water cooling, for example, wallowing. And this is something we've talked about before, too, because that also seems to be part of their natural behavioral repertoire. So if you're here in the beginning, you saw my slideshow. 
cow 2285 started to wallow in her water trough, which was very frustrating because I thought she was really clever for doing so, but then she was receiving water cooling that wasn't part of the treatment, which is so frustrating. So yes, I mean, I think that's part of their natural behavior, and it'd be nice if we can give them that kind of option, but again, because of concerns about food safety and health, I don't think it's that common. Yeah. Although I like the idea of understanding their behavior and working with it, rather than just saying, we've designed this perfect thing and it works in a vacuum. Like, I think understanding their behavior helps so much, but unfortunately there's a lot of feasibility challenges that we face. Benetti. Can you talk a little bit more about what your next steps are and what you think they need to prepare aside from the strategy? Hmm. I'm just gonna say that I'm looking at some really exciting opportunities, but I don't have anything decided. I'm just gonna leave it at that for now. <laughs> <laughs> just hope we get this grant. Okay, thank you guys so much again for coming.